Hometown Daily, Season 2, Episode 215 for August 3rd, 2023. Nacho, Nacho Cheese Truck. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to do a quick rundown. Fake Town in Canada. A drink at Starbucks with barely any coffee. Staff are put on leave over water crisis. The Fogbo of Siberia, CEO to worker income disparity reaches 272 times. Update about Canadian wildfires, another vehicle recall of 92,000 vehicles, Strange New Worlds, the musical, the AI-powered foodie menu, if you build it, they will sue, nacho cheese truck, and Shai Huludia, the sea worm. Next on Omtown Daily. I am Marawat. That is Omtown.com. And up there is the AI from on high that keeps me in check and out of trouble. Maybe we'll find out in the long run. Wanna say hi? Good evening, Omtown citizens. That works too. Um, I need to there's music playing for us, but I don't know anymore if y'all hear it out there in the in the in the podcast on youtube i even when i play this back i don't pay attention to the background music just like i'm barely paying attention to this background music um so if it's really really quiet uh, somebody let me know i'll find out after this show and go and look and pay attention to the background to see if it's coming through but um for some reason i don't think that it's coming through loud enough on the podcast or stream side um as per usual twitch doesn't let me know how many people are in chat and unless people are talking and um, if you're lurking you power the internet so thank you for lurking uh, but my uh, my stream says that i'm unstable so again i don't know if it's a personal attack or if it's actually a technological limitation um, but i'm not losing any packets or anything like that I know, totally inside baseball. I should probably chop all of this out, but I don't. You get to hear how the sausage is made. You want to get into today's news? I do. <laughs> Please. Anything but this. Right? Well, that might be enough detail about how the sausage is made for today. because We have to dole it out across multiple episodes. That's true. Okay, let's get into it. Uh, the very first article is over in the Omtown Daily channel. Surreal fake town has Truman Show vibes and viewers are obsessed. I'm not sure. I, I, I found it interesting because I've actually seen this being talked about and then an article was made. It was quite fascinating to see how this actually happened. Uh, um, over a couple of weeks period, I think, um, I've been seeing this fake town Truman show kind of discussion taking place online. Uh, and then an article popped up in hometown and it was submitted. So I thought it was interesting to include it today. Um, it says several TikTok users were intrigued by the empty streets of the fictitious backdrop with one writing. It's the best place when there's a zombie apocalypse, but no, not really. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. Um, so let's go over to the source of this article. And so Kim is the uh, author over at newsweek.com. And, um, I think they've got an actual video it's muted. So I'll hit play and it's, it's like a video within a video because they've got newsweek has put like, um, text on top of the video and they talk about this 23 acre town called Pickering. Um, but it's actually a back lot for, uh, movies. Which is kind of weird, but I guess if you live near it, maybe. Right. It's, it's different than just seeing it on TV or something. Um, but then, I mean, if you've ever gone to like Universal Studios or any other back lot tour, then you will have seen this or at least heard of this. If you, uh, m most movies aren't done well, I. I can't say most, I don't know exactly how many, but I would say a considerable amount of movies are not done in the wilds of New York streets or some other 
you know, middle town America kind of, hey, look, this town looks really cool. Let's just start filming there. There's too much liability, too much insurance, too much everything, regulations, and who knows what type of impact surveys and, you know, lubing the chassis of various locations just to get, you know, filming done. But then all of this, and this is what it looks like from the air. Apparently this is part of it. I mean, that's pretty elaborate. That's not what I'm visualizing. I'm thinking of like a one building with a facade. <laughs> yeah. Apparently it's pretty significant. Um, I find it really interesting that somebody's probably leasing sections of this to various movie, uh, production companies and they're filming within this. Um, it's pretty cool. The latest post comes amid Hollywood writer strike, the uh, uh, writers guild of America, the union representing thousands of TV and film writers went on strike in May after six weeks of, uh, talks with Netflix, Amazon, uh, Apple, Disney, Warner Brothers, NBC, Universe, blah, 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 all of which fall under the umbrella of the AMPTP broke down. Um, so none of this is needed right now. Ouch. Wow. That's probably putting a pinch on somebody's budget. So I guess movies are going to go up in price because when all is said and done and everybody returns to work and prices, you know, salaries and, and, and other things are being doled out and more, because the people collecting the money are utilizing all of the writers works and putting stuff like this to use because this doesn't get used without somebody writing something right. And, and writers don't have anything to write unless it can get turned into a movie or maybe a book or something like that. Right. But mm, oh no, um, you're not going to get a writer to book economy going really there's, you have to be in a lot of different places. Books get turned into movies perhaps, but you have to write them. Yeah. You need a screenwriter, which I don't think that's going to work right now. <laughs> it's, it's almost like they should be value. AMPTP should be valuing writers to a greater degree and doling out that 250 million CEO salary, a little bit more out to the rest of the people that are doing the writing and on set and so on. By the way, there was another article about that today, not about writers, but CEOs having 200 and some million dollar salaries. Yeah, that's actually one of the articles we're going to talk about. Oh, I didn't about, realize that about, was selected. Never mind. <laughs> about halfway through. <laughs> Everybody forget <laughs> that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but then uh, the, the reason why I thought that this was really interesting was that it's an entire backlot designed to exploit what the writers write. And it's a massive amount of land and but it's up in canada by the way and if canada has their way we're not even allowed to write about this stuff if we don't uh, we can't talk about this because they have a law now going into effect that large organizations like google and meta have to pay to link to material which i think is crazy oh we're over eight Seems minutes kind of anti-free so. speech but okay not even that i mean it, it's the antithesis of the internet now i i understand if it's wholesale like stripping the whole site and posting it locally but my understanding is that they want to start charging for even talking about it. It's kind of like the NFL. Maybe I'm reading too much into their law, um, but you really need like, you need a Ouija board and a seance and a decoder ring linked together to figure out what the hell is actually intended. But the spirit of it is that you need to pay um, to talk about the news which kiss my shiny metal ass. There's no way, there's no way the internet can exist 
But I think it's a, what they're doing is they're trying to target large organizations, large advertising vehicles. Um, but from the tiny seed grows the mighty oak. And so at what point do you arbitrarily throw in the line? Well, you're big enough now. Oh, well, if I make a million dollars, then I have to pay um, to talk about when so many news organizations are built off of somebody providing information for free um, or with the hopes of getting some money, you know, and it's a pittance at i.e. go look at the AMPTP people are barely getting paid yet <laughs> but I guess that's somebody else's problem to deal with uh, you know not the not the publishers anyway it's all convoluted it's uh, see how everything is connected that kind of thing that's associative thinking um, and uh, it, it isn't it isn't as simple as just pointing at one thing and, and laying blame. There's a whole, it's a societal mechanism here. Um, and we've got a bigger problem. And let's just say that greed is the number one <laughs> issue. Um, so in a nutshell, this huge set is just sitting there. Um, I'm sure that there are people actually utilizing it, but it's, probably not at the same level um, unless scabs are coming into Canada to do the work um, for the writing etc so it says here um, the strikes have been uh, has seen some major productions put on hold I'm kind of bummed about this because Stranger Things is put on hold Marvel's Blade is put on hold um, Severance and, and Paramount's Evil I don't really meh. Um, but uh, Blade is actually I designed a blade um called an s glaive back before <laughs> blade existed um and i and when i saw that design uh, used in blade i nearly lost my mind um because uh, i had entered a contest and uh, it looks identical now i'm not saying that they took my design i'm just saying that my design was um it was distinctive and looked like the blade from blade. And so I knew it was a nice design when I actually saw like somebody actually make it a reality. Um, I knew that my original design was on target. I don't know how I lost that competition, but anyway, um, <clears throat> so it's always cool to see something yeah, really darn close to your idea show up somewhere um, because you know, you're on the right track with whatever it was you were doing so anyway pretty cool um <clears throat> again <laughs> totally off track but connected all right so unless you have something that you saw that you want to add to this um there is a whole bunch of information over at this uh article um but it's kind of the minutia of things uh, we want to tease you into going over there and reading more about this stuff and then coming and talking with us here on twitch and over on youtube and via the podcast discord all over the place um <clears throat> what do you think of this well i'd like to visit this town and see what it looks like but i imagine it does look like things like universal studios um it just sounds kind of neat but maybe kind of creepy <laughs> if it's kind of like an abandoned town kind of feel yeah that's that's what it is it's it's a tiny little fake town where i guess some you're gonna have to get a whole bunch of people and and this is speaks to that whole ai thing you know because if you measure this whole fake town then you can put real actors in it and then you put fake ai actors in it um, and therein lies the rub with the whole idea that you're going to get paid for one day of work scanned into a system and then used in perpetuity. That's one of the things that's upsetting a lot of, um, actors. Yeah. Kind of a bummer. Um, so fans of Reacher television, um, no, uh, the television show, um, Reacher, uh, may recognize the fake town setting in the latest viral clip which forms the backdrop of the crime thriller series so it's that you know kind of small town backdrop but apparently it has a nuclear power plant 
because that as you do in small towns <laughs> yeah every small town should have a actually that's one of the things that might be getting uh, created is little micro nuke um, generators we'll see we'll report on it when it shows up well we'll report on the reporting because that's what we do we don't do the empirical reporting itself we talk about what people are talking about and react to it hello toll welcome to the show we're just moving on to the next article slowly this next article is over in hometown daily it's the hottest cold drink at starbucks and that's not a hot it's not a cold it's a cold drink that's hot or is it a hot drink that it's the hottest cold drink anyway it so barely it contains warm yeah it's a room temperature uh drink tepid. apparently <laughs> oh tepid there you go um literally the title is it's the hottest cold drink at starbucks and it barely contains any coffee now when i saw this i i basically said eh, i don't really know about the whole uh, what's the point of drawing attention to this because not everything at starbucks is a coffee drink um but it that it says it barely contains any coffee so maybe there's an attempt at it so i was really curious about what this is all about so let's just go over to businessinsider.com uh toll says modular micronuclear reactors are the real solution to green energy i agree toll and i are in the same camp thank you i'm glad you said something toll really do appreciate that um because sometimes i you know what i'm gonna back up a little bit just just because i, I want to separate these two discussions and and see this this little fake town that we were originally talking about um has part of it set as a, a nuclear power plant and i mentioned these little micro nuclear power plants are going to be coming online might be 20 years from now but they're in development they're in the research and development phase I seriously believe that they are the only defensible long-term green energy solution because you cannot solar power can be destroyed easily. Wind power can be destroyed easily. One simple little bomb can destroy a dam. And that actually happened in Ukraine for crying out loud. I mean, we can, we have demonstrable evidence of, green energy not being defensible right here right now you know in your lifetime but you can sink a micronuclear power plant down in the ground under 12 feet worth of concrete and no bunker buster is going to get close enough and you can move it wherever you want it and bury it there and as long as you keep it somewhat secret then it'll be harder to be a target um, but it's going to be harder to be a target regardless, right? Because you, you hide it or at least make it defensible in some way. Um, but you know, you can wipe out an entire, uh, Nevada or Arizona solar array with flechette rounds from, and you know, an airburst above it, just wipe it completely out. Um, same thing with wind generators. You, you shoot one blade, it goes wonky and tears itself apart same thing with the dams so modular micronuclear reactors are the real solution to energy green energy and that's um toll and i are on the same place okay so awesome oh uh, toll says that they lived next to a modular micro reactor for 13 years and exposed to 0 0.003 millirem lifetime exposure <clears throat> i mean that seems pretty low i don't know the um exact um units or whatever but yeah and i'd have to go and look again it's been a while since i paid attention to um, how many rem you can actually get and i i'm i would be surprised like i would like to know how you were exposed um to that um uh, oh oh um i suspect toll was in a nuclear sub um solar and wind require large-scale batteries to be sustainable yes batteries require cobalt and other rare earth yes lithium and and so on um yep yeah and and 
Toll's bringing up all of the the all of the knock on things that we talk about here in hometown um, to draw attention to these things like slave and child labor labor manual open pit mining and stuff like that um, driven by uh, China uh, manufacturing and and uh, processing um, and the 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 local government of those people saying here's a bunch of people because they have long-term contracts to do certain things and the quality isn't really up to snuff and they can't actually pay it without doing this kind of forced semi-forced labor kind of thing so it gets really it gets really uh messy so um gotcha oh okay prior to submerging was the exposure got it you got to stop licking the inside of nuclear reactors toll um i know that they're minty but you got to just stop doing that okay uh, let's keep going uh, <laughs> i love talking about this stuff so uh we were talking about starbucks i'm gonna uh, snap through this uh, do this transition again um so the hottest drink in uh starbucks barely contains any coffee um it's over at businessinsider.com and nancy luna is the author of this article uh these are the uh, are these like the barbie refreshers or something starbucks says its refresher drinks are gaining in popularity throughout the day uh that's interesting okay um Cold beverages, especially refreshers, are driving sales at Starbucks. It might be because this is the hottest. Yes, this is a good time <laughs> to get cold beverages. <laughs> day to day. You know, there's a, um, just outside of Omtown was a frozen yogurt place that didn't survive the pandemic. But if they would have survived the pandemic, they would probably be billionaires right now. Um, and just to back up for a second, Toll says uh, it makes their tongue tingle to lick the inside of a nuclear power micro nuclear power plant so yeah <laughs> i know i i can't help myself either tall whenever i see uh, a nuclear power plant i have to go and <laughs> lick the containment unit <laughs> just saying that sounds wrong toll also says that the lung their youngest loves the dragon drink and the pink drink is pretty good Okay, well, I guess I'm going to be swinging by Starbucks because I haven't had these. Uh, they look like strawberry something, um, and that one might be the dragon fruit one. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll give it a chance. Cold drinks accounted for 75% of beverage sales in the company's third quarter. Again, can't imagine why. 110 degree weather. Um yeah i was joking the other day that um there was there's somebody that we know that went to alaska for vacation and i said so how's the jungle doing and everybody started laughing because it's so hot that i'm i am guessing that alaska is gonna turn into it all the ice is gonna just steam and it's gonna become a jungle um, just a massive forest and all the stuff is going to thaw. Yeah. Toll says that that dragon fruit is really good. Sweet and tangy mi mixture of flavors. Still not as good as the nuclear reactor. Starbucks refreshers, a popular line of fruity drinks infused with green coffee extract, usually sell more in the afternoon, but lately they've seen double digit sales grow, uh, during uh, all parts of the day. Laxman Nera Simon, the CEO, told investors during the chain's third quarter earnings call on Tuesday. As such, Starbucks is leaning into these drinks, which debuted in the U.S. in 2012. Of course, it's the summer launch of their Starbucks refreshers, frozen beverages. Wow, they got a bunch of them. Uh, lemon, uh, different lemonades like passion fruit lemonade, uh, mango dragon fruit lemonade. I started drinking monster uh, energy lemonades. Um, it's from, they actually call them Australian lemonade. Um, I don't know. It doesn't want to kill me, but. 
right? Everything in Australia wants to kill you. Everything in Australia wants to. Yeah, that's the rumor, at least. I don't know. I haven't been there. I want to go there, but I haven't been there yet. Um, so cold foam, the latest or the fastest growing add on in Starbucks can be added uh, to refreshers and Starbucks is rolling out faster and easier to use cold foam blenders to meet summer demand for Starbucks refreshers, frozen beverages. Cold foam is, is that like the, the little, uh, like, a um, CO2 containers where you just squeeze the handle and it foams up right yeah i guess so i mean isn't it kind of like what's on the top of a um, of it anything cappuccino? yeah i thought but i don't know maybe we've got something wrong here i don't know maybe you can look up what a cold foam is versus whatever regular foam is i know hot foam i don't that i mean the, the only hot foam that i know of is the stuff that i uh, put on to shave but that's i don't know that's weird oh that looks good i <laughs> see a picture from starbucks with a vanilla sweet cream cold foam hey and it looks and... kind of like uh i don't know Toll it says... looks more like um something else like not uh a latte or whatever oh interesting okay well i mean and by the way, you and Toll just said the same thing. The vanilla sweet cream cold brew is very nice. Yes, I agree. I, I like the 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 cold brew sweet cream nitro. Um, there is something that when the nitro goes into any drink, like Coke actually had or Pepsi, uh, which one is it? They have a nitro um, can right now. Um, and I've had the the nitro ones from Starbucks. Um, and it, it seriously changes the mouthfeel. You, it really is a more enjoyable coffee drink, um, when you have that nitro. So it's really, yeah, Pepsi. Thank you, Tall. Um, they have a, a nitro infused can it's under pressure and it contains this, the nitro in it. And then when you pop it, it opens up the container and foams up and it changes the, the, the Pepsi, um, sensation in your mouth it's really good um i've only had a couple of those um, but i gave up soft drinks so hot milk foam on a cappuccino or latte yeah yeah but then they, there's this cold foam blenders to meet the summer demand for starbucks so it's this is interesting um i just wish i don't know starbucks <laughs> They've put a lot of small businesses out of commission because they can manage at scale, right? They benefit from scale. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Now it's gonna, they're going to become more and more automated. They've already said that they're starting to automate the process. So you're going to start losing some of the character of the employees that are within the organization, which uh, again, it, that, if that's what they're going to do, that's what they're going to do. But still more and more coffee shops disappear so i want competition damn it that's what i want um, but small businesses can't compete with the scale that uh, organizations like starbucks and walmart and so on compete at um, the margins are just thrown out of alignment um, so i end up just making coffee i don't Anyway, it says here, we're particularly encouraged to see cold espresso beverages. We're up 13% year over year, um, said uh, Nara Simon, who took over as CEO in March. So yeah, imagine selling a cold drink at pink, uh, pink peak summer months during the hottest uh, days ever recorded. I am shocked. Well, I have to say, I mean, their timing is excellent because pink is really taking off because of yeah. the whole Barbie, Barbie. mania. Yeah. And then you got climate change. So, I mean, it's great conditions for selling it. And it so does look really good. Like a Barbenheimer, is this Barben Bucks or Barbie Bucks? <laughs> Barbie Bucks, I think. Star Starby? <laughs> That's better. Starby. Starby. Toll. Your sentence here in chat 
remember Pepsi's 1886 line? You mean originally? I, do I? I don't know how I'm supposed to take yes, that. Mayor Watt tall. Is that old. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. I, I gotta shave a little closer apparently <laughs> like a an old miner from california <laughs> oh that's funny uh but i don't remember the 1886 line pepsi's 80s 8086 line Ni yeah i'm thinking maybe 1986 <laughs> Yeah, that would be nicer, but no. Uh, Toll wrote Pepsi's 1886 line. I think that's the original, like the original, original formula. Um, and so it had cocaine in it or something like that, right? Oh, Pepsi. Wait, that's a different one. Um, so, yeah, it, it had other things in it. The original flavor, I thought, was slightly different. But um, there are some new flavors that are coming out. 1893 yeah that they made a, a throwback line yeah i'll have to go and check out more about that i seem to remember something but i don't remember it um really so but that's okay we'll have to swing by uh, starbucks we have to leave ohm town which is really tough because we're just a bunch of electrons in a wire so we have to transport ourselves out of the out of Ohm Town and go out into the real world and touch grass as it were. Okay, let's keep going. We got a whole bunch of articles. We're like on article two. Um, this next article, actually, let me back up for just a split second so that I, just to make sure, I'm gonna throw that into the chat and uh, throw this one into the chat as well. Uh, you think Amazon delivers to hometown? Maybe. I, um, <laughs> yes, sure. I think they still have them at Wally World. Black can, gold lettering. Hmm. I'm going to have to look into that. This sounds like fun. So if you're a city staffer and you do something, you can be put on leave. City staffer put on leave after water crisis, partially caused by human error. A Germantown, Tennessee employee was put on leave after finding uh, human error partially caused contamination that left residents without clean water for over a week. Well, that's kind of a serious error. Nadine El Bawab is the author over at abcnews.co.com for this article. Uh, the deck statement is during the crisis, town residents reported a strong odor coming from tap water. Yeah, that's never a good thing. So it says it was partially caused by, uh, okay, so the city determined that a diesel spill was in part due to human error by a tenured employee. A tenured as tenured employee, that's such a weird turn of phrase because depending on what domain you work in, <laughs> tenure means something completely different. Um, so... They were placed on administrative leave after a diesel spill contaminated the town's water supply and left some residents without access. Um, the employee will remain on administrative leave pending the completion of the investigation. I don't know. Accidents happen. But what did they have to do to circumvent any controls that would have kept diesel from entering the water supply? You'd think that they would be on opposite sides you the fueling station is way over there and the fill station is way over there you know you fill it up over here and you put diesel way over there uh, never the tween shall meet about 100 gallons of diesel contaminated about 4.2 million gallons of water that were being held on site they gradually lifted the restriction on using the tap water They'd have to drain the entire system and keep on checking until the diesel is no longer in parts per million high enough to cause harm. Well, no wonder we have water shortages. Well, I, I don't know how much, how many millions was it? 4.2 million? Yeah, that's not a lot. I mean, it's in the grand scheme of things, it shouldn't be wasted, but um, 
a mistake of 100 gallons of diesel into 4.2 million gallons. Um, it, it, it took time to get it out of the system, but yeah, and, uh, that's a hell of a water bill. Taxpayers in the town is going to have to pay for it. So it says good, clean soil has been acquired to backfill and compact the area in the full repair. The generator has been fully inspected multiple times by outside contractors to ensure that there are no issues with the generator. Um, but there was a breach to the pipe at the location, which allowed diesel fuel to, uh, in the soil to enter the reservoir. The pipe has been repaired and the contaminated soil is being removed and contained on site and will be properly disposed of as required by regulations. Uh, to me though, if the person spilled diesel, but there was something that allowed it in that they could not have possibly known they shouldn't be held responsible for anything other than the diesel spill so i okay. hope that they don't really do anything uh long term for to this person um this video here has absolutely nothing to do with the article so let's keep on hustling through this news The next article is over in Hometown Daily, a rare white rainbow spotted over world's largest freshwater lake in Siberia. And all you have to do is go to Siberia to see it. Let's just run straight on over to the source. Pandora Dewan is the author of Maybe this. Maybe you can encounter those 40 million year old uh, worms. Oh, the that worms. Are being... oh, <laughs> that are having babies. <laughs> We end up talking about worms again. I don't know what's going on with the news, but there's a fascination with worms. Um, so Pandora Dewan always finds these really interesting, like uh, things that you would think somebody like Pandora and a box, you know, <laughs> um, would spot. And uh, this one is uh, equally interesting because I've never seen anything like this other than as a haze or something. Um, but this is over at newsweek.com uh, and uh, the link's already in the chat. So you can follow that um, if you are interested. Apparently it was spotted above Lake Baikal and that's it. It's a fog bow. That is unusual looking. And this could easily be mistaken for a like a craft by somebody who is looking out from a distance and seeing this you know, glow emanating from the, it's kind of like the ships of way back, you know, old sailors used to say that ships were flying, but it's actually the, um, a distortion of light that makes it look like a ship is above the horizon. Um, and so that it's Was flying that back in 1886 back when they released the, the Pepsi that toll was talking about. Yeah. 1886 or 1893 one of those days um i remember being on one of those ships back there there's a joke by the way about a steering a ship and a captain going into a bar um <laughs> i'm not allowed to say it it's okay maybe hometown after dark we'll talk about it anyway fog bows also known as ghost bows or white rainbows are much rarer than their color counterparts and only appear when the conditions are right, which is identical to ghost bows or rainbows. The conditions have to be right. And when you see a double rainbow, it's because it's at the same um, angle of attack at two different places. Like one is 33 degrees, I think. And then another one at like 52 or something. I don't know what the actual uh, angles are. Um, but you can get like a rainbow will always appear, um, at these angles. It's pretty interesting once you know about it and you're like, oh yeah, okay. Um, just go out after a rain, you'll see a rainbow. Um, but these are really distinct because they're built by fog, bending the light at the right angle. Um, and it has to be falling at the right angle thick enough to capture the light and bend it at your into your eyes. It's pretty cool. Um, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that before. So it's pretty neat. 
you know, stuff that I hope uh, you can see one that you don't have to travel to Siberia because unless you live in Siberia, that might be a little difficult to go find. You might be able to, um, anywhere there's a heavy fog and the sun comes out. Um, because if the, as soon as the sun comes out, it'll cause that as long as the fog is heavy and the sun pops up. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So the next heavy fog um, outside Ohm Town, we'll go and check it out. I'll plug you into the, well, you're already in the Raspberry Pi, but I'll plug the uh, camera into the Raspberry Pi and take you out so that you can actually see it outside of a sensor. All right, let's keep on going, folks. Got lots of news. This next article is over in uh, Ohm Town Daily over at ohmtown.com. Uh, CEOs made 272 times more than their workers in 2022, earning nearly $17 million on average. CEOs at 500 major firms make 700, sorry, 272 times more than their workers, according to a new report. So if you have aspirations of working as a, an employee somewhere, uh, really scrounge up that energy to be a CEO because that's where the real money is. Uh, that's per uh, latest executive pay report from the AFL-CIO, which looks at the S&P 500 compensation. On average, CEOs make $16.7 million, a $5 million increase over the last decade. Um, I <laughs> told drop this little line in here into the chat. This is a topic I bet we are at odds on. <clears throat> maybe i don't know um it because it really depends there's there's always context um but i think that a person should be able to make what they deserve to make um but i think that a lot of ceos are hired not necessarily because they're the best candidate but because they're the best candidate that has applied um, or they have political connections or a bunch of other variables. So, um, but happy to discuss it. Um, and I'm never really hardline about anything with the right evidence. Um, but you know, with extraordinary claims requires extraordinary proof. Um, CEO paychecks, uh, once again, dwarfed how much workers are taking home in 2022, illustrating a gap that's prompted a skyrocketing number of strikes and labor actions as workers demand higher pay and better conditions. Um, yeah, so, um, and, and Toll brings up a, a good point. Um, articles like this will sometimes compare the salary of a CEO like McDonald's to a minimum wage teenage employee. Um, Juliana Kaplan is the author of this article over at businessinsider.com. And, uh, yeah, um, that may very well be the case for many things. Um, so you always have to look at what it is that they're actually analyzing. Um, but it's usually average worker pay. I don't think, uh, well, I don't know. I'd have to look at this um, with a, a finer tooth comb to uh, go into it deeper. But um, here we just talk about what that actual ar article is. And then uh, maybe I'll be able to talk about this later at a deeper level. Um, while CEO compensa compensation tumbled a bit from 2021 to 2022, falling 9%, Brandon Rees, the AFL-CIO uh, Deputy Director of Corporations and Capital Markets noted in a press conference that this was due to chief executives reducing the use of stock option comp, uh, comp, uh, compensation. My goodness. Um, and uh, I suppose, yeah, it, it may be because <laughs> they're switching to cash instead of to stock options. By any measure, CEO pay is still off the charts by historical measures. But it, see, it's because it's outperforming um, every other element. Um, I, I struggle to see, because a CEO isn't typically, well, it really depends. It's so hard to try and encapsulate CEO compensation um, in 
um, a succinct, cogent discussion, like one statement, I should say, because um, context really does matter. Um, so the report comes as uh, workers' wage gains cool in the face of less hot labor market, even as prices still remain high. The thing, the thing that I uh, really have issues with is that CEO and executive pay is increasing at a rate that is outstripping um, what average employee salaries are earning as an increase. And that's being wiped out completely by the cost of living. Uh, Toll says, uh, but look at it this way. If you took a small portion of the incomes of all the workers and gave it to the CEO or owner, CFO, whoever in, exec in charge is because those employees wouldn't be employed if the leadership wasn't there. Um, but uh, yeah, there wouldn't be a company without the employees though. Um, so and and many companies are when you're paying somebody 17 million dollars or 250 million dollars they've got enough momentum that you would literally have to <laughs> stop operating for it to not keep on churning that's why a c uh, that's why a large corporation actually is an entity unto itself it doesn't actually need directors to exist in in the market um and it doesn't just dissolve itself it has to be dissolved by a human it has its own identity it has its own um like passport it can actually be a citizen uh, all unto itself it just happens to have a whole bunch of heads at the top um like a chimera you know like there's just, or a uh <laughs> or a um uh, what is it the, the 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 bad guys in MCU in the in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Hydra, like a Hydra, you cut cut off one head and two more appear, that kind of thing. Um, so, my point is though that there's a whole lot of leadership. They're making a ton of money. They're the one that's in charge of uh, paying themselves via either their own decision making process or a board of directors. And they're also the ones that are setting what the pay range is for employees. And the only way that the employees can make more money is if those people that are senior leadership go, let's give them more of our profits. And so instead of say 25% or 20% profit margin, they're telling everybody, well, if you want a job at all, then you'll take this amount and there are people out there that will take it. Um, and, and these senior leaders will, can say anybody can do this job. And that's the real shame because it's still human beings. At some point it you'll, they'll get to the point where they just won't bother with humans. They will switch to automation. Um, and, and that's where it's actually ending up. So, um, Toll says that they think that the problem is, uh, the wage gap is also in part caused by the government by continuing to subsidize projects and continuing to drive interest and inflation up with a uh, poor economic policy. The leadership is making more money because the business is making more money, but the leadership is still struggling to keep pay raises up with COLA. Um, yeah, not with themselves though. Um, leadership doesn't have to worry about cost of living um so well and yeah. there are also potential differences depending on the company size like a small business ceo yeah is going to be a little different or presumably is going to be differently situated with the workers than a much like a mega corporation yeah and and i've based on everything that i've seen read talked to um i certainly have come to the conclusion that as the amount of money increases, the people that are the senior leaders become sociopathic about it. They, they detach from their humanity as viewing the employees and, and just don't care. They will take what they can, um, as much as they can, as often as they can. Um, 
and literally treat the employees as if they are, you know, chattel. Um, Because they can arguably get anybody to do this, you know, X job, but they fail to remember that they started maybe at that level too. Um, But they, you know, made their bones. So they got theirs and they can move on. Um, So, yeah. Another aspect is the average worker. uh, Toll says um, another aspect is the average worker doesn't think about is... uh, when there's an increase in profits, the leadership has to make a decision to invest in the company, invest in the benefits for the employees, invest in the employee wages, invest in new technology to make the company even more profitable, pay off the government officials to keep subsidizing their projects. Well, that last one, that one, that one might be more true than um, I, I like to acknowledge. Um, but yeah, well, I mean, that's part of the thing, but you can't, my argument is that you can't have, you know, 20% profits, 20% growth and, and not pay your employees, um, a wage and research has shown that when an MBA takes over a company, wages are suppressed, workers are worked harder, uh, Benefit is going to the C-suite and to stockholders and major stakeholders and then buying back stock from the market so that it's the wealth is encapsulated more into uh, the senior executives. So uh, let's keep on going. Um, We've got a bunch more articles. This next article is over in the Hatch Ideas channel, which um, is all about business. But this is unprecedented Canadian wildfires obliterate previous annual pollution record in just seven months. Um, Yeah, if you're, this is still ongoing. Um, Hundreds of wildfires in Canada. Astonished climate scientists have warned that the unprecedented nature of what's happening in Canada is a harbinger of what's still to come. Um, This is an amazing event. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think I've ever read how long the longest wildfires have been burning. Um, but this seems like it's been going forever. I don't have that stat, but I do have, as of today, there have been 5,173 year to date fires and there are 1,041 active fires, 25 new today. Yeah. But, and, but just what was it like two days ago, there were only... There were 500 and something fires and now no out of control. The numbers look relatively constant um, because they have a a high number over 600 out of control. And then they have um, like almost 200 that are being held and then a little over 200 that are under control. But you put them all together. That's about where it was, say, a week ago. Um, This article is over at CNBC.com by Sam Meredith. Uh, Europe's Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service on Thursday said that accumulated carbon emissions from Canadian wildfires had soared to 290 megatons in just the first uh, seven months of 2023. This is already more than double the previous whole year record and accounts for over 25% of the global year to date. Astonished climate scientists warned that it's unprecedented and will continue. Um... Tulsa's um, Europe, they burn biofuel as an uh, alternative to oil and coal, and it's just wood and pollutes like a wildfire. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, wood, like wood burning stoves and stuff like that. Um, I'm not sure about how much that uh, um, adds to the total amount of um, pollution like a wildfire this is the astonishing thing i mean this is just amazing amounts of particulates in the air and see but this is like natural right like if a fire if lightning strikes it it burns and it burns until it gets exhausted nature puts it out um but with all of the human um exacerbation of 
the climate, right? We're burning all kinds of fossil fuels. We're warming up the water. We're warming up the air. Um, forever chemicals, keeping things dry because it's dying off and, and just everything that humans well, are doing, right? And if we're not doing active forest management, um, like sometimes we don't do burns because we're afraid of the fire risk, but then that actually exacerbates problems down the road. I mean, I don't know if that's specifically contributing to the Canadian ones, but yeah, this year's wildfire season has been the worst on record in Canada with more than 13 million hectares or 32 million acres uh, burning so far, scorching an area larger than the size of Portugal or South Korea, which how many people are going to be able to envision? Oh, oh, Portugal. Oh, oh, OK, I totally, totally got that. Um, plumes of smoke from hundreds of blazes have blanketed vast swaths of the country in recent weeks. That's what it looks like, folks. Aerial view of wildfire of Tatkin Lake in British Columbia, Canada. Yeah, exactly. Tull says, 2,000 years ago, if lightning struck in what we now call California, would there be a group of firefighters trying to put it out? And what would be the effect of the atmosphere in that case? Yeah, it would just keep on... It would just keep on um, going until it exhausted itself or there was a big enough rain. Um, but I suppose, you know, there there weren't 8 billion people to worry about. Um, and, and, and definitely a, a dip, different atmosphere based on all records. <laughs> it was a different, literally a different world that uh, those people lived in. Um, uh, I suppose in the microcosm of it, they actually ran around and tried to put it out. Yeah. Yeah, I get it, Toll. Mother Nature has a way of balancing things out. We'll see. <laughs> uh, we, we will definitely see. We're more of an active participant in its change, though, so I think that the the anthropomorphic changes the 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 reason why things are as hot as they are is science has shown that it's human um driven not natural um and in a natural sense it would normally resolve itself balance things out the ebb and flow and take thousands of years um, but we've done this um not in thousands of years um but largely since the industrial age, so maybe 250 years. So the uh, Cam said that wildfire season typically occurs from May to October in the Northern Hemisphere with peaks in July and August coinciding with the hottest and driest months of the year. So it's kind of like the, the no shit news at what, 10 o'clock? That's already 10 o'clock, wow. Um, okay, let's keep going. I'll make this one quick. This next article, um, it's over in uh, Hometown Daily. Hyundai and Kia recall nearly 92,000 vehicles, tell owners to park outside due to risk of fire. We've had these periodically. Um, I'd say at least one a month. <laughs> um, it sure seems like it. It's not a good sign when you can't park your car. Well, you can park your car, but it just it might spontaneously combust. So... Uh, Hyundai and Kia are telling owners of nearly 92,000 vehicles in the U.S. to park them outside because an electronic controller in an oil pump can overheat and cause fires. Uh, this is over at um, abcnews.go.com. It's an AP article. Yeah, let's let's see here. Now, the recalls cover certain 2023 and 2024 Hyundai Palisades, as well as some 2023 Tucson, Sonata, Elantra, and Kona vehicles. Affected Kias include the 2023 Soul and Sportage, as well as some 2023 and 24 Seltos vehicles, which I've not even heard of. I don't think I've ever heard of a Seltos. Um, uh, there you go, Toll. Um, so those are the the models 2023 and 2024 uh, palisades uh tucson sonata elantra kona soul sportage and seltos 
Okay, Hyundai and Kia are having a very rough year. Yeah. Because those were the ones with all the like completely easy to steal vehicles. <laughs> um, like no theft protection, essentially. Oh, Toll says that the Seltos is their compact SUV. Huh, oh, that, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, that one slipped by my radar. Um, yeah, so I... What did I, I, I might have actually said all of the vehicles except for the carnival. <laughs> so cool. All right, let's keep on hustling through these. Come on. My transition is so slow. Okay. This next article is in the continuity report. Um, how Star Trek strange new worlds brought its delightful musical episode to life. You're like, wait, Spock is singing now. That's a quote from the, um, oh, and I missed their sedans. So, well, they missed their sedans. Uh, it wasn't in the list. So, uh, okay. I do have to warn everybody. If you haven't seen the new strange new worlds, there are going to be spoilers in the discussion. I've already spoiled somewhat. If you didn't know already that this latest episode is a musical, um, how they get there and when it all started. That's actually part of this discussion. Adam B. Very over at variety.com put the article together. And if you're not into Star Trek or Strange New Worlds and, and or musicals, you're really not going to like this. Um, but um, it says the the story is going to discuss the, the plot, that it's a musical, developments in the season, um, so I, I'm, I don't have like a spoiler thing to put up there other than, uh, just say, come back in five minutes. Um, but we may move on to uh, the next article sooner. Anyway, I'm not really a musical person. I, I like, I love music of all uh, shapes and sizes, right? But musicals aren't really my jam. This was actually fun to watch, um, fun to listen to and surprising that everybody who was doing some singing was pretty damn good at it. Actually good. And some surprisingly good. And then there was some funny singing too. Yeah. Yeah. And the, some of the lyrics were actually entertaining. Um, and everybody had, everybody was a star. I mean, it was a real standout moment for each, uh, you know, lead character, uh, singing their heart out in the episode. Um, the only thing that I, that I'm really wondering about at the end of this episode is what's going on with nurse, uh, chapel because, um, they're leading towards her going somewhere else. And so I'm wondering if nurse chapel is actually going to be leaving the show. Um, I don't know. Um, but she's got an opportunity sure looks like it right yeah um now <laughs> and i i won't really stay deep into this article i don't want i i don't want to spoil anything for anybody um but <laughs> there's a klingon federation interaction <laughs> like 80 percent of the way into the show and um um, this is a serious spoiler, so I'm going to ruin it for anybody who hasn't seen it yet. So again, turn away, mute or whatever, and come back in about two minutes. So there's a, a fold in space time. And it actually pulls uh, the ship and then eventually the sector into a different and alternate reality. Uh, where everybody spontaneously bursts into song um, <laughs> and then the Klingons get involved at the very end um, and they too burst into song and not just any song and not just any situation, but it's like the lead singer with four backup dancers on the bridge of a battleship from the Klingon empire. And instead of it being the rough and gruff voice it's 
<laughs> what do you want to? It's a boy band voice because he starts to yeah. make a threat, right? How would you, you would call it that, right? A boy band voice? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, I would <laughs> say it might be like K pop or something. Yeah. Yeah. It was this, it was amazing. Because he starts out wanting to threaten the Federation captain and then goes <clears throat> and then just starts singing like a boy band. Um, and I I could not stop laughing. It was hilarious. You would never in a million years hear the Klingon Empire singing like this. Um, and then to really push it, um, they they have to do a whole what did they call it what do they refer to it as basically a spectacle they they had the entire ship singing and dancing the same like song like a finale i think yeah um and, i mean it's such a contrived situation to get this into a musical thing but it had been around in the process of being made planned um all the way back to picard um and they balked at Picard. They couldn't get it done fast enough, um, even the beginning planning. And then uh, they said, well, we better wait until season two of Strange New Worlds. And then for six months, they had this idea getting pushed. Um, so it's a, it's a lot of fun uh, to watch the show. So this was really neat to, to see them actually doing this. Hey, take care, Toll. Thanks for hanging out with us. Appreciate it. Uh, great conversation. Really do appreciate it. Um, so what's next? Don't know. I don't know if they're ever even going to bring this back up, um, but it's part of canon now that they have burst into song. Well, and there's something funny about seeing characters like um, Pike or Spock singing i don't know what it is but it's just amusing to watch yeah. and if you'd said well is this going to be a good episode if it's a musical and yeah, maybe not but it somehow worked yeah they did a really good job of this um and by the way just to drive home where this was sourced from a writer back during picard came up with the idea of doing a star trek musical um, so again, feather in the cap for writers, because without writers, none of this would exist. I think they deserve more. Um, they definitely need benefits from the streaming world because that's where everything is shifting. And these BS contracts that don't have it enumerated or even have the ability to redress this as the market shifts, uh, means that they suffer while the companies benefit from the profitability of shifting over to uh, streaming markets. So um, I'm, I'm in favor of the working class much more because the working class is the one that's doing all of the work while the executive class and the billionaire class don't suffer these uh, issues to the same level um you know a three percent for a billionaire is not the same for uh, the same level of three percent for a person who's only making thirty thousand a year um and a lot of that isn't because they worked their ass off to get there it's that they were born to opportunity but that's another discussion we can get into that as time permits let's keep going this next article is over in uh, Hometown Daily. Luminary, an AI-generated pop-up restaurant, just opened in Australia. Here's what's on the menu. From bioluminescent calamari to chocolate mousse. We'll go straight over to the source. Aaron Mock is the author at businessinsider.com for this article. Um, Stephanie Wu, a hospitality professional, used OpenAI uh, chat GPT and canvas AI image generator to create the concept behind a new pop-up restaurant. This image is an AI generated rendering of that restaurant. Um, it was described by people as having a foggy atmosphere, um, kind of surreal dreamy. 
like it looks almost underwater or something. Um, yeah, that's how the, the picture looks. Um, but apparently there was um, fog generators that were pushing like a, a smoky atmosphere. Um, I don't know if it was really underwater, but, um, you know, feeling in person. Um, but uh, they said the theme behind the AI generated restaurant is the art of illumination, which includes a menu and interior decor inspired by four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. Um, it was a, uh, a pop-up. So the restaurant came to fruition after Wee's, uh concept won a competition led by Applejack Hospitality, the restaurant group behind Rafi, a uh, to create Australia's first AI generated restaurant. Um, if you're looking at the stream, then you get to see Luminary's South Coast tuna dish. It looks really good. And that has to be spicy as hell. That just screams spicy. Um, anyway, after the chatbot suggested a few ideas, she chose her favorite one. From there, she used the chatbot to tease out specifics like the restaurant's name, menu, and lighting decor. Um, restaurant was uh, decorated with expert use of lighting, haze, and LED technology, and a lengthy food menu with dishes categorized based on the four elements. The water menu contained seafood dishes like smoked kingfish and scallop. The earth menu featured vegetable plates like grilled zucchini and crispy eggplant. The fire menu uh, included bioluminescent calamari and coral trout all grilled on a fire. And the air menu had desserts like coconut espuma and um, whipped chocolate mousse. Well, you had me a chocolate mousse. Eh. What do you think? It had an ember glow fire inspired drink by uh, that has gospel rye whiskey and smoked blood orange. I mean, it sounds very cool and it sounds good for foodies. Not yeah. your standard dining experience. Yeah. I don't know. The, it would have to be amazingly expensive because just going to a place like McDonald's right now is costing 20 bucks for you know two people to get fast food and, and barely, uh, you know, a regular meal type of fast food no drink well and we saw that with the taco bell pictures how much you're actually getting for your money <laughs> yeah i'm really curious about the outcome of that um and i haven't been to chipotle since the the word was listeria but what my brain said was listerine i don't know what they're a little on. different from each other they're just a little bit yeah i don't think that you want to uh use listeria as a mouthwash let's keep going we've got a few more articles uh this next article oh did i not put that other one in there doggone it so there's that one and here is the previous one sorry folks it'll be in the show notes though you can get there um the next article is uh, over in hometown daily a man returned home to find a 1.5 million dollar house on land he acquired decades ago and now he's suing for two million dollars dr daniel kennigsberg said he returned to his hometown to find a new house on his uh, property on property that he owned the research or through research he found that it had been sold fraudulently in 2022 um Said a Connecticut lot he acquired in 1991 was sold without his consent in 2022. So in 1991, he bought it. It was sold in 2022. He recently visited his hometown to find it under construction um, <laughs> on the lot that he owned. Can you imagine driving up to your property and seeing that? That might be a little startling. No, it's amazing. Uh, Jordan Pandy is the author of the article over at businessinsider.com. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and so now he probably, well, not probably, he has to sue. Uh, he is suing the LLC that purchased the land since he said it, he never sold it. Um, I'm going to be really interested in what the outcome of this is because who had the rights to sell it 
you know? And how did they represent that they did since they obviously didn't? Yeah. Um, it's just odd. Like, there's two parties to a real estate transaction. So I don't really fault the buyer here, but assuming they didn't uh, collude or anything. But yeah. Uh, so who sold it to 51 Skytop Partners LLC? Konigsberg is suing that company, but shouldn't they be the going original, after the person? Are they su suing the buyer or the seller? I think they're going after the seller, right? No, doesn't look like it. Oh. Right. Fairfield County property records show that the property had been sold in uh, October 2022 for $350 to 51 Skytop Partners LLC. $350,000. Did I just say $350? Eh, it was cheap. Um, so $350,000 to this LLC. Um, so Konigsberg said he had nothing to do with the sale and is now suing the company on nine counts, including trespass, statutory theft, unfair trade practices, according to the lawsuit. The lawsuit, which was filed in federal court in July, seeks to avoid the 2022 sale and is asking for damages and compensation up to $2 million dollars. Not quite sure why that would be. It also orders the defendants to remove any structures and or materials from the property and restore the property to the condition that it was in prior to the defendants trespass upon it, which is pretty damn near impossible if it had trees in it of any value. Which That's it where... looks like it did because it was surrounded by trees in the photo. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to get that. To yeah, build that. It's just those trees have been turned into that lumber so good luck and the whole stuff about trees is way expensive uh, man because it takes so long for a tree to grow um so yeah it would include removing the four bedroom four thousand square foot house that's currently being built on it so who who had who uh, sold it i'm i'm really curious yeah Let's see, the power of attorney. In this case, the right to sign documents on Konigsberg behalf was granted to lawyer Anthony Monelli of Trumbull, Connecticut. Monelli was named as a defendant in the lawsuit alongside Gino Leto and Greg Abujaj, I guess, Abugage of Skytop Partners. So, huh, this is really interesting, right? So the landowner's attorney apparently colluded with the other parties here well a lawyer named anthony manelli of trumbull connecticut sorry was... he may not be actually ken expert correct yeah, yeah somehow he was granted power of attorney so who granted that person this shouldn't be going to tri trial this should be this should be like a criminal prosecution yeah right yeah yeah i mean that it looks like it's, it can't be, it's not an accidental thing because somebody had to assert that they were the owner. And granting power of attorney. Who was it right. that did that? So if Anthony Manelli sits there and says, well, Konigsberg did via the phone, then you've got a bigger problem with, um, uh, whatchamacallits, the, the people that verify, I have, what are they called? Are you thinking like clerk of the court kind no, of thing? No, the or? people that the people that verify your identity when you're signing a contract. Oh, like a notary? A notary had to have verified power of attorney. So that person it Yeah, but the problem with that is they only have to verify the identity of the people signing, so Yeah, which means Konigsberg would have to have signed documents granting power of attorney. Right or with id i mean would that part have been forged and then the notary yep. is only for manila i mean i don't know we don't have enough information well i mean the notary would have to have the id of the person represent saying that they are konigsberg and granting anthony manelli power of attorney right but what if manelli showed up with like forged documents for konigsberg and then exactly. the notary's only checking manelli's manelli or whatever <laughs> well no it can't be 
uh, like if Anthony Manelli showed up with a person pretending to be Konigsberg and had fake identity, that's the only way that a, a notary would be able to authorize that document. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, none of this makes any sense. Yeah. So um, let's see. It says besides missing out on a $350,000 payday, Konigsberg said he was holding on to the land for sentimental reasons and had intended to pass it on to the next generation. Uh, well, should say finish the house. We'll send it to you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was like, compensate them and keep the house maybe instead of, you know, tearing yeah. it down and then having empty land there. It's interesting. This is really interesting. How anybody could have gone, like, made this possible is just beyond me. It's just fascinating. Well, okay. I think what's interesting is the person was out of the country. So I think that has something to do with it. Yeah. Like, it's one thing when you live a street over from your property. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Um, the next article is over on the Mobile Channel. Worst queso scenario. Truck spills nacho cheese on Arkansas Highway. Officials with the Arkansas Department of Transportation said the incident took place around midday after a truck carrying the cans of cheese merged into the same lane as a wrecker truck hauling an 18-wheeler on Interstate 30 near Prescott. Whoops. Um, I'm going to refresh this and see if there... Yeah, there's nothing. Um, so, oh, wow. This is one cheesy accident. A truck carrying nacho cheese crashed on an Arkansas highway Tuesday afternoon, leaving a cheesy mess across the roadway. <laughs> on Tuesday evening, officials with Arkansas Department of Transportation posted two pictures to social media. Taco Tuesday, anyone? Hey, they don't have to get sued. You can use that now. So, yeah, cans of nacho cheese all over the place. Wow. That looks like a lot of nacho cheese. In half of it, maybe a third of it is underneath uh, an overpass, and that's where everybody is hanging out. But, yeah, they probably should just push all of that over to the... Um, that little side spot right there, let all the cheese fall into it and then start picking it up over there because the road is impassable right now with just mountains of nacho cheese cans. Maybe they uh, can use a street, a street sweeper or something to get the cans out of the road. Oh gosh. Can you imagine that street sweeper? They would just have to park that whole street sweeper into the landfill. Drivers exactly. on the other side of the country, meanwhile, faced a similar situation earlier this week after a truck carrying chocolate became engulfed in flames on Interstate 80 in California on Monday. We missed that one. I saw that one come through, but it didn't look as good as the nacho cheese article for some reason. <laughs> yeah, cheese. Mm. Road cheese is always the best cheese. No? No. Is that too much? Yeah. Did I throw that? Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me throw this into the chat. We'll keep on going. Um, there you go. And then our last article for tonight. Um, this next article is in the mobile channel study offers glimpse of 500 million year old sea worm named after the dune monster. It's actually a giant worm. But anyway, excavations at a university of, or by a university of Kansas paleontologist working in a treasure trove of fossils called the Spence Shale Lagerstadt um, have revealed an ancient sea worm unknown to science until now. The findings been published in the journal Historical Biology. There's always a journal. Oh, I read a little bit about this. Um, so the articles over at fizz.org, University of Kansas is the byline. So um, the University of Kansas paleontologist that's working on this, um, it says here, when she found the fossil, Rhiannon Levine, a research associate with the KU Biodiversity Institute and Natural History Museum, 
was part of a team camping and carrying out field work in the High Creek area of the Spence Shale, a geologic formation straddling northern Utah and southern Idaho. The area has been famed since the 1900s for its abundance in some 90 species of Cambrian trilobites and soft-bodied fossils. I'm a soft-bodied fossil. One of the last... Going back to uh, 1886. There you go. Um, So they found this fossil. Um, They realized that it wasn't something that existed before. And uh, they named it Shaihuludia shurikeni. Shaihulud is the indigenous name of the worms on the planet Arrakis in the Dune novels. And uh, shuriken is the Japanese word for a throwing star representing the shape of the blade-like uh, kaite, the, the chitaneous, uh, like armor plates. Let me scroll up or down. There you go. There's a graphic representation of it here. I'll blow it up. Boom. So that right there, um, so like little arm- armor. Yeah. Little armor plates. Um, but it's a worm and apparently how old is it? 500 million years old. I don't know how they suss this out from that. So I guess that's the little blades for it. And then you can kind of see underneath it, the, the body. I'm not sure. I just don't, I, it's amazing. I mean, they're probably dating it by just looking at the rocks surrounding it or something. Right, not just that, but the shape and all of that kind of stuff. It's amazing oh, yeah. that they just Absolutely. they pull all of that out. That's why they get paid the big bucks, though. Um, like the worm sci-fi namesake, Shaihuludia shurikeni is a big deal. Describing a new species of Cambrian annelid doesn't happen every day. Annelids are very rare in the Cambrian of North America, and so far we only knew of a single specimen from the Spence Shale, said lead author Julian Kemig a paleontologist with the State Museum of National History in Karlsruhe, Germany. Anyway, um, the fossil that uh, the, uh, the way that the fossil is preserved is also of particular interest because most of the soft tissue is preserved as an iron oxide blob, suggesting the animal died and was decomposing for a while before it was fossilized. However, with the analytical methods used in the paper, we show that even with limited preservation, you can identify fossils. Pretty amazing stuff. Um, And all of this is hard science, folks. So while you're learning how to program, learn hard science too. Uh, I don't know. If I could do it all over again, I'd probably learn programming. Um, Now I'm a little mode of dust and I wander off. I can't focus long enough. All right, folks. Um, It says here that the discovery gets us to think about deep time. Levine said we, uh, when we look outside, we see all the animals that we know. Now we look, uh, Now we can walk past a duck, go to the beach, and see a starfish and all the critters that exist in the ocean. We kind of know what to expect, but then we can let our imaginations go a little bit to imagine what happened a million years ago, or in this case, over 500 million years ago. What does the ocean look like then? Well, apparently, it looks like little sea worms that have armor plates. It's a worm eat worm world out there, folks. There has been a lot of worm activity in the news lately. Yeah, well, this one is fossilized, so they're not going to be able to thaw it and have it start replicating. Oh, God. So the other one was frozen, I, but I understand. Fossilized is a little different. <laughs> <laughs> a little? <laughs> I'm just going to leave it alone. All right, folks, that's the end of the show. So let me drag you back to the front page and we always refresh it and talk about maybe a couple of the articles that might appear in this. And um, most of them are all about a certain someone having to say that they're uh, not a criminal with the same people where another president said that they weren't a criminal. 
Back to the Future review. Broadway's musicals car is in the star in underwhelming screen to stage duplication. That's a hard one to actually say. A variety article about Back to the Future musical. A uh, monkey snatching a woman's purse in Bali. My understanding is that's pretty common um, in uh, play locales that have monkeys. Uh, they are sometimes trained to go and do that, and sometimes they just do it. Um, but yeah, that I've, I've understood that that's actually pretty common. Having oh, there's... another person's dog for 10 minutes uh, calms you down, I think it was. Yeah, it's another person's dog. Well, exactly. You know why that calms you down. Yeah, it's like buying a boat and selling a boat. You pet the dog, you get all of the joy, and they go home with their owner, and um, somebody else has to clean up all the poo. And take them out for a walk in the... In the rain. Whatever the weather is. In the, yeah, flaming hot magma. That is current weather. Um, at least in the northern hemisphere. Um, let's see. I don't know. Fortinet leads cybersecurity stocks sharply lower after warning of deal delays. Oh no. Okay, everybody. Humans are usually the weakest link in cybersecurity, so be situationally aware. Don't go clicking on random crap. Ooh, Fisker reveals all electric Alaska pickup. Three other EV prototypes. Yeah. Going from prototype to production is a huge thing, folks. So let's hope that Fisker launches another all electric that has fast swap batteries. Probably not. All right. We'll keep on going through the news. Cover the last 24 hours for tomorrow's show, 9 p.m. Eastern. In the meantime, like us, follow us over here. Well, like us. Um, No. Follow us over here on Twitch, like us, ring the bell, subscribe over on YouTube, subscribe, follow us over on the podcast. Um, click the link that takes you over to our Discord. We have a Patreon that's live now. Um, yeah. We have a TikTok. Oh, the TikTok. Yeah. Um, that's actually what these transitions are. I'm actually breaking our stream up into little segments so that we can do the TikToks. Um, the, the problem really is that I, I, I need to filter out the good ones, um, the really good ones, because I know that y'all want to. Not all of them are little gem segments, but um, I hope that you get a kick out of the articles and uh, follow the links from the show notes and, and check it all out, because there's a lot of news out there. And I I use Omtown every day to manage my information overload. I hope you do, too. Anyway. I'm Merwat. That's hometown.com. Up there is the AI that keeps me out of trouble. I want to say a bye-bye. Good night, hometown citizens. We will see you tomorrow at 9 p.m. Eastern. True story. See you later, folks. Bye-bye.